what you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. This podcast is sponsored by Jackson Creative, a custom communication agency located in downtown Hickory, North Carolina, specializing in online content creation. To learn more, visit thejacksoncreative.com. Jackson Creative, we tell your story. What you want, when you want it, where you want it. This is The Mesh. Foot Candle Films. Film news and reviews from two guys who really like movies. This episode is brought to you by the Foot Candle Film Society. For a schedule of upcoming screenings and membership information, visit the Society's website at www.footcandle.org. Hello and welcome to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. My name is Alan Jackson. I am the co-director and co-founder of the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival. With me, as always, Chris Fry. How are you doing, Chris? Doing well. Chris Fry, also with the exact same title, so you can just basically say ditto to everything I said. Yes. Co-creator, co-founder, Foot Candle Film Festival, Foot Candle Film Society. But I am not often confused with the country singer. That no, is, that is a that is an honor I have all to myself. <laughs> yes. So there are no country music song, uh, singers, as far as I'm aware, with the name Christopher Fry. I don't get like you know random tweets sent at me or requests on like Facebook. Dozens daily. Right. Uh, did you? Did, I, don't, I know this has nothing to do with movies, but uh, you know. it was just a few weeks ago. Um, I think Alan Jackson, the country singer. Uh started up a brand new concert tour. He hadn't been on tour for a while, I guess. And so Alan Jackson was trending on Twitter nice. as like a hot term across the United States, like top <laughs> search term. And everybody starts sending me messages nice. to my Twitter. Cause my Twitter is at Alan Jackson sending me Twitter messages saying, are you okay? Is everything okay? Oh my gosh. I'm so worried that why are you trending? A you know, is, uh, hopefully he didn't pass away or whatever. Nice. All these messages, people praying for me, they're talking about me. It's, um, hey. it's an interesting life. I have to live I imagine uh, on, on things like that. Anyway, let's get back to movies. Sure. Uh, this is foot candle films right here on the mesh TV. This is our film review and discussion show that we have, get together a couple times a month to talk about both some new films, and then we also have a little movie news and some other things we like to talk about in the industry. And then we always end with some recommendations at the end of the show of films we think might be worth your time checking out. Chris, we got a great full show today. We've got two films we're going to be reviewing. The first will be, and let me make sure I get this right, originally the film known as Birds of Prey, in the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, now known as Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey. Ah. However you want to call it, that's the film we're going to review first. Then we're going to follow that up with a review of a film starring Shia LaBeouf, written by Shia LaBeouf, uh, an autobiographical film called Honey Boy. Then we'll move on to our new section where we actually have some trailer tapas to share with you. Some, uh, we're going to walk through some trailers and dissect a couple of the ones that have just been released. And then we've got a soapbox section. I love the soapbox section where one of us, and in this situation it's going to be Mr. Fry, has a something on his mind regarding the film industry, the film business that he wants to get off his chest. And I'm going to put the soapbox down. He's going to step up there and tell us all, everything he's thinking about it. Then we'll end up the show with our recommendations of the episode. So, Chris, what do you say we go ahead and get started? Let's do it. All right. Let's move into our first review, which is the latest DC uh, DC Universe or Extended Universe movie. I'm still confused on, on how they brand all this. Regardless, it is Margot Robbie starring as Harley Quinn in Birds of Prey. This all started when the Joker and I broke up. It was completely mutual. And soon enough, I was back on my feet, ready to embrace the fierce goddess within. <laughs> it's oh so quiet. Now that I cut ties with Mr. J, I'm about to learn that a lot of people You're want me dead. All alone. And at the top of that list is this guy. But it turns out <laughs> that wasn't the only Damon Gotham looking for emancipation. You fall in love. So with Birds of Prey, Chris, we have the latest DC Universe film. And this is a 
a group of films that's included the Superman movies, the Batman movies, uh, Justice Justice League, League uh, kind of a rocky, rocky uh, filmography, Squad. Yeah, <laughs> Suicide Squad, kind of a rocky filmography for this series of films. The one thing that came out of the Suicide Squad film that I think people all kind of agreed on was a brighter spot of that film was Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. So what do you do when you are a, a, a film studio and you've got a moderately successful film that most people did not like, but there's a one really great element of it? You give that one great element their own film to go and roll with. Now, just a little quick backstory note here on this film, as I kind of alluded to in the introduction, it has gone through a name change. That name change being something where they now want to highlight the fact that it's a primarily Harley Quinn film where the initial title, the film Birds of Prey and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn didn't necessarily play up her name quite as prominently. And they're thinking maybe the poor box office results it had below expectations might be because of the name. So Chris, my question to you, was the name the problem with this film or were there other things that might have been impacting the box office returns in your mind? Uh, Or do you feel like the box office returns at being lower than expected are not indicative of how much you might have enjoyed this film? Tell me where you fall on this. I mean, I guess I'm not surprised the box office returns are lower. Um, It's a female driven comic book movie and, you know, fanboys tend to, you know, like they raged against Wonder Woman, even though critics liked Wonder Woman, they were mad about some things about that. Um, so yeah, Suicide Squad positive on Harley Quinn. They spin off and have her own movie. I think the naming of it, I understand why they did it the first way. Um, because that's kind of a very Harley Quinn thing is to be kind of long and confusing and rambling. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I renaming it, I think is probably what they, you know, probably wise, I guess to call attention to the fact that yes, this is a Harley Quinn movie. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually I think it was the right thing to do, because the whole birds of prey element for me really held this film back. I feel like, um, I think the script probably was a little bit, had a little bit to do with that. Maybe, um, not being familiar with, I know this is based on a comic book kind of run or whatever, but not being, I, I know that. And that's all I know about it. Not being familiar with it. I felt like the film suffered from, what, for lack of a better term, I'll say the script blender effect, which is where you take a recipe of actors that are real known, you know known characters that audiences are going to know, fanboy goodwill, and a story from a comic book run. You hit blend and throw the mixture up on the screen and see what happens. And plot and story usually suffer from that. And that's what I felt like this film was. Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn complete dream casting. I still think mm-hmm. she did an excellent job with what she had to work with. Agree with you there. Um, you'd mentioned she was the bright spot in suicide squad. Mm-hmm. If she hadn't landed an Oscar nomination for I, Tanya and recently for her supporting role in bombshell, I'd actually be kind of worried for her that she would be typecast as Harley Quinn forever mm-hmm. because she does such a good job. It's kind of hard to think that anybody else could ever do Harley Quinn <laughs> because yep. she's doing such a good job. So, you know, in the scenes where she's having fun and story's not that important, yeah, okay. You know, I, I could enjoy the movie. Um, but, yeah, there were definite problems with it. And I can see why people aren't just heralding this as an awesome movie. Yeah. So. Uh, it sounds like we're on a similar page with this. I will say I had a moderately good time with this film. There were enough interesting, fun points to keep my attention but the biggest problem, and you you hit right on it, is it was the the story, the script. It was I still can't tell you exactly what the plot of this film was. Um, <laughs> and a part of the problem is they're trying to do too much in the film right. by introducing too many different characters and having each of them with their own little subplots. And it just made for kind of a confusing mess where, honestly, we just wanted to spend time with Harley, right? I mean, right. that's pretty much the idea. Well, then that's what you're expecting to do because despite what the title may or may not have been and all the previews and everything, yeah. you see her. You see yeah. Harley Quinn. So. I don't understand why this couldn't have just been a solo Har- Harley Quinn movie. And it would right. have been fine. It would have been a good, fun enjoyment. But trying to pack so much of the plot and story and so many machinations of, well, we have to get this diamond and it has to go this, but now this person's gone and we got to go find that person to help us get that next thing you know it just it just got to be too much and it was really just stitching together 
some fun set pieces. There were some great fight scenes sure. I enjoyed that were sure. kinetic and, 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 and interesting. But it was all stitched together with just why is this character now involved and why are we doing this and where are we going with this? Well, that, you know, I think it's indicative of DC's problem to begin with. They were too impatient to try to play catch up to Marvel. Yep, so right. instead of giving each character their origin story, they went ahead and had Justice League and then after the fact gave Aquaman his own movie. Yeah. They were too rushed. I agree. I think this movie could have served as a single standalone Harley Quinn movie. And then if it was successful, say, okay, let's give her a sequel where we introduce the whole birds of prey aspect, but they're, they're not, they're not patient. They're, they're, they're wanting a franchise. They're wanting to build characters quickly and to grow a film universe. And I just, I agree. I, I, the moments it was all Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. It's basically DC's version of Deadpool. You know, it is, a little bit of breaking the fourth wall at times. It's kind of, you hear the narration, you know, in her head of her narrating what's going on. And she's this very kind of loose cannon character, but she plays it. So just like Ryan Reynolds, I think really gets the Deadpool part. I think, I think Margot Robbie totally gets this character and it's fun when you're just following her and, 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 and kind of involved with her storyline. It's just, unfortunately out of this hour, 50 long minute movie, a good third of it is trying to do a whole lot of other things with a whole lot of other characters that you really just don't care about at the end of the day. Well, and you mentioned trying to become the female Deadpool, which I think is something the actual comics have been accused of recently yeah, they too. Are. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as far as her role in the DC universe, trying to mirror too much Deadpool. And I think Deadpool actually has a character that then like references a female character. That's now mm-hmm. like the female Deadpool that kind of makes fun of Harley yeah. Quinn. Anyways, um, I was thought it was interesting going to this film. It was rated R suicide squad was PG 13. And that kind of set me on like, okay, they really were trying to adult it and make it Deadpool. And I think, I don't know. I just think that was kind of a mistake. Just too much too. trying to car- carbon copy. You mentioned the characters. This, th- let me just say on that. This sure. film did not need to be rated R. It could have been to me. Er- no, it didn't have to be. It could oh, have been it just as right. enjoyable. It didn't have to be. No, no, no. I'm but saying the language it definitely and was rated was R rated for the content. You. I'm right. saying, but it didn't have to be a rated R. They film. needlessly threw in a bunch of swear yes. words and stuff. Yeah, I, I think agree. that hurt the box office. I think they assumed that just because Joker was a big rated R film, but that was a whole different type of film. Right. This is a true comic book movie, and they should have let it be PG-13. All I the agree. profanity and the just over-the-top extreme violence was unnecessary to the film. You could have had just as good a time with the film. Unnecessary unless you're trying to copy Deadpool. So. <laughs> right, but obviously it, it didn't quite hit the box office they were no. looking for with that. Absolutely but not. back onto the film itself. Sure. Um, you know, I think visually it was a fun movie to watch. I think it had some great uh, fight sequences. I think the use of music was really good, the different needle drops it had. It's just, I just felt like I was watching more of a montage of those fun action sequences stitched together with whatever was being held together with a plot and a whole bunch of random characters that I lost interest in anytime they went to those characters uh, away from Harley. The production design, kind of talking about the colors and the cinematography, ample graffiti you see everywhere, it gave Gotham kind of the ghetto look while not steering into the drab, oppressive color palette of Todd Phillips' Joker. So I, I appreciate that, and I thought it was actually an interesting distinction, too, with the early Batman Schumacher films and how he kind of went Dayglow and Dick Tracy and how it cartooned it up too much and made it, I don't know, it kind of took me out of it, whereas this seemed perfect mm-hmm. for a Harley Quinn movie. So I'll, I'll praise the production design as well. Costume design, I thought, was really good, too, for Harley Quinn. There's a part where she wears this outfit that has kind of fringe on the sleeves Mm -hmm. and you just would think it's fringe. But if you look closely, there's bits of police tape, like caution, do not cross, you know, police Mm -hmm. line, like Mm -hmm. woven into that. And that's just kind of a cool detail of something that, yeah, Harley would probably do something like that because she's, you know, out of her head. Um, The opening animation sequence Mm -hmm. in this film, um, I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. And it was used to kind of, set the stage for this film and bridging the gap between Suicide Squad and where this film starts, kind of her breakup, so to speak, or what her going sour with the Joker. What was also, you know, gratifying for me to see is that in the credits, they credit the Warner Brothers animation as the ones who did the art for it. And they're the ones who did like the animation for the Batman, the animated series yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So it it was kind of a nice fanboy mm-hmm. synergy there that I I did appreciate. So yeah. 
you know, this film had had enough fun moments. I will say, I, I kind of came away saying, yeah, it was it was okay, it was fine, it was a uh, serviceable film. I just wish I wish they would have gone full tilt into the Harley character. I wish they would have stitched together a little uh, smoother, cleaner plot and story to follow. Outside of that, it's good. I mean, it's just yeah, it's just they just tried to do too much. It's just trying to do too much in this film. Uh, with too many characters and trying to bring in too many different plots that they're trying to build a universe. And I wish they would just hone in and explore the characters they have. Yeah. I think the, the ideas of the characters for the birds of prey are interesting, but would have been served like we've kind of mentioned in a sequel (laughs) where they could have had more time. I was really confused when I saw that Ewan McGregor was cast as the villain, this film after seeing birds of prey, I think McGregor was kind of confused as well, but rolled with the punches as best he could. But I, I didn't like him in this, and I usually really? universally like Ewan McGregor. I didn't find him to be a convincing bad guy. I didn't really find him huh. scary. I, found I actually him really liked him in this. A fool. Um, he wasn't interested. And here's the criminal, the criminal sin for the villain, the criminal. He wasn't interesting. <laughs> he was just kind of like this, you know, really rich person who whines and complains. And then at the very end of the movie, he puts on this black mask. That is, and you're like okay, but that just makes you look kind of like you're going to a Day of the Dead mm-hmm. festival in Mexico. Like, there again, I'm sure there's lots of comic book explanation and fanboy service, and they maybe appreciate it more than I do. But to me, it just seemed kind of silly. I I liked it only because I like seeing Ewan McGregor play a very different type of role than he normally gets to play. To get to go over the top and to be goofy and silly and kind of a, you know kind of a little bit of a just a dumb petulant villain i think he was having fun with it now whether or not the 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 role was very clearly defined for him and he was giving a lot of direction of kind of where to go with the character probably not it did seem to be a little all over the place but i generally had a good time because i i'm you know we're so used to ian mcgregor i feel like anyway very stoic earnest characters outside of like train spotting you know other than that he's kind of kind of played a, a little more um, either low key or a very uh, very serious actor, and we got to see him kind of have some fun with this. So I did enjoy that aspect of it more than you did. It sounds like, yeah, it sounds um, like it. But overall, I, I just feel like uh, this food movie could have been a lot more uh, than it was. As it stands, I mean, it's a fairly comfortable comic book adaptation film that. Uh, I, I'm not going to say I don't like it because there were enough moments I enjoyed and had some fun with, but as a whole, it just didn't work as a whole film like I had hoped it would. Yeah, I thought it was a mess, but it was entertain- just entertaining enough. I am curious to see what Margot Robbie's, because she's signed on to do it, Harley Quinn looks like as James Gunn takes the helm for the next Suicide Squad movie. <laughs> I'm curious yeah. to see what all that, because she, you know, her name is up there. She's doing it, so I'll be curious to see how that how that plays out. Okay. Fair enough. Well, that is what's now referred to as Harley Quinn colon birds of prey right. is the film that you will see at the movie theater. If you were to go out now and try to see it, um, that is, and we didn't even mention, you know, director and other things. I, it honestly, there wasn't enough in the direction to really stand out for me to say that, you know, uh, I want to give too much credit to the director or producers. I think you said production design, I agree, was good. But we do have Kathy Yan, who was the director of the film. Again, confidently done, but nothing yeah, that really just, just blew me away. Nothing that was really visually terribly interesting outside of the actual production design to watch and the costumes that we saw. So, all right. Great. Well, that is Birds of Prey, or Harley Quinn, or Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey, whichever way you want to look <laughs> at it. Let's go ahead and move on to our second review, and it is the film Honey Boy, starring and written by uh, Shia LaBeouf. Hello? I wish I was a little bit taller. I wish I was a baller. I wish I had a girl who looked good. I would call her. What am I being arrested for? What am I being arrested for, huh? You think you're hot? Because you don't know how good I am at what I do. Honey Boy depicts a young actor's stormy childhood and early adult years as he struggles to reconcile with his father and his own mental health. The story mirrors the film's writer and star Shia LaBeouf's own life. Coming out of last year's Sundance and Toronto International Film Festivals, the film generated quite the buzz. The fervor subsided, and some now cite the film and the acting therein as one of the Oscar snubs of this year. 
Alan, what was your experience with the film, and do you feel like it was deserving of any nominations? Um, so my feelings on the film are mixed. Okay. But you asked about any awards or recognition. So I will say this. I, I think there were two really, really good performances in this film. Okay. Um, bordering on three. <laughs> but two for sure. And okay. uh, I'm know. wondering which two you think were really good and which one is the border one. Um, I will say that I thought the so okay, so I know I know what one of the good ones is. Yeah, yeah. So a little background to you. We've got a film that is written by Shia LaBeouf and is about his life. Shia LaBeouf plays his own father in the film. So his they're given all fictional names, so it's not the actual names of, of Shia or his father, but uh, Shia LaBeouf is playing James Lort, who is basically a representation of Shia LaBeouf's real father. You've got Lucas Hedge is playing Otis, who is the representation of Shia at age 22. And you've got Noah Jupe playing him at age 12. I really, actually, you know what? I enjoyed all three performances of all three. <laughs> I think, okay. but I was generally impressed with Shia LaBeouf's performance as his father. I thought it was engaging. Um, I think it worked. I think it had some, some good moments in the film where we really get to see this relationship and, and see how, how the impact father and son had on one another. I will say Noah Jupe playing Shia LaBeouf or the character Otis at age 12 was excellent. Okay. Probably my favorite performance in the film. That's my, that's actual, my literal note in my notes. It says no, Noah Jupe as Otis was excellent. Excellent. See, there we go. <laughs> so We're on the go. same page. Uh, he was Incredible, very, very good young performer. Lucas Hedges as the 22 year old version was fine. I felt like he was probably trying to play a Shia LaBeouf uh, impersonation too many times in his dialogue, his mannerisms, his language, but he was, he was fine too. But everybody's talking about or wants to talk about Shia LaBeouf in this film. You know, mm -hmm. of course, it is a autobiographical film. Um, it's, you know, written by Shia, he stars as his own father. And obviously that's where all the attention goes because Shia LaBeouf has had a kind of interesting up and down troubled pathway through stardom. Sure. And I think his performance was good. The film itself, I, I will say it's not what I expected and maybe not ultimately what I wanted, but what I got, I think I appreciated in that it was a very much uh, fly on the wall, uh, just watching day to day life of, the Shia LaBeouf character and his father as they are, uh, as is, as, as Otis in this situation or Shia is a child actor and going through, uh, some of the trials of living with his, his father in a motel outside the set. It's all framed in a rehab where Shia LaBeouf's character is 22 years old and he's in rehab and he's recounting a lot of this as, as the younger version. I liked the framework of the film, the fact that we're watching kind of a parallel age 22 and age 12. And there are moments where those two kind of connect. They have a, a moment, a shared moment between these two timelines. And I thought that was interesting to see and watch. Um, I probably just wanted a little more. I felt like the film really honed in and just showed us a lot of very repetitive, uh, situations between, um, uh, the younger Otis and his father. And I felt like it could have gone a little deeper. It could have gone a little further. It could have gone a little broader, but for what we got for the moment in time we got, I thought it was well, well done. So it is a mixed kind of bag for me, Chris. I can't come out of the film saying I loved it, but I certainly did appreciate it and certainly did see what they were trying to do with it. So I want to hear your thoughts. How do you feel about this film? So, you know, positives I would say are, you know, Noah Jupe, like you said, his portrayal of Otis is, is excellent. I thought the direction of the director, Alma Harrell, who this was her first narrative feature. She's made some documentaries and some narrative shorts and some music videos, but this was her first big narrative film. So I thought, you know, direction worked well. It's interestingly, and actually Lucas Hedges, I thought was pretty solid. He didn't have a lot of screen time, um, which I think it may have helped balance it a little more if he did. But the stuff he did of you know managing to portray a lot of LaBeouf's mannerisms and actions, vocal tics, and like his rages and stuff like, unfortunately, Mr. LaBeouf has been on the internet 
yelling and screaming a lot. And I think a lot of that, he kind of managed to capture some of his manicness. So Mm -hmm. all that worked. Interestingly enough, and I'm not saying it was a weak part, um, but LaBeouf, he's always been an actor I've been interested in, but his portrayal of the dad, his own father, came across a little bit too on the nose as an abusive father. I didn't see a whole lot of nuance, and maybe that's the point. Maybe it's just like he's nothing but a monster, but there are some aspects of the film that make you think like, no, there should be a little bit more shading here, and I think that comes down to probably the script, and that's what um, story-wise I felt like LaBeouf's own script may be the cause of the more run-of-the-mill story in the experience of what I was expecting, kind of like you from the trailer and the way some things I thought that it was going to be not, I don't want to say fantastical, but some of the imagery was going to be more dreamlike or more, I don't know, more, more interesting to me than just kind of a run of the mill coming of age story with an abusive parent. And Mm -hmm. that's to me, it was a little bit more, straight and narrow than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, the film did take some interesting, well, it starts and it's very, yeah. What was the word you were? It's not fantastical, but it's kind of a very, it's very creative in that it's, I love the opening shot of this film. It's probably one of my favorite opening shots. Kind of hard to follow and disjointed on purpose. Well, I'm talking about even the very first shot, which is him on the transformer. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's fun. And then you've got this montage, which yes, was also very good. That whole opening got me really excited for this film. Cause I'm like, okay, this is where we're going and I'm loving it. This is great. And it did kind of fall into a very traditional, just father son narrative after that point. Right. It would have moments where it would, go a little bit more into the fantastical side. And I appreciate those moments, but they were few and far between and they were never as effective as they were in the first 15, 10, 10 minutes or so of this film. Agreed. So that was a little bit of a disappointment for me. Um, so I just, I wish they kind of would have picked a, 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 a style and kind of gone all in on that for the whole film, as opposed to reining it back into a very, very traditional, a um, little bit of melodrama type of environment to it. So, there were a couple scene moments that I will say really honestly were just great scenes. Um, we have a great moment. Uh, Noah Jupe primarily playing this part where he's speaking to his father, but yet you don't know if his father is actually able to hear him or not. And he's speaking to him from outside the room right. and he's really opening his heart up and he's really saying the things he's always wanted to say to his father. And there's a moment where you feel like, Although it's in that dreamlike state where you feel like maybe something was going to go the right way, and it didn't, and it was a very, uh, it was a wonderful fit scene though. Yeah. And then there are a couple scenes, even though I I I don't necessarily say that I thought that uh, Lucas Hedges was the strongest part of this film, but I do think some of his scenes in the rehab facility were really well written as individual scenes. He has a moment talking to a counselor. They're arguing about whether or not he's actually acting right now or yes. whether this is truly real. I'm like, yes, that's very raw, open dialogue that I'm loving hearing there. A um, couple moments with that and then him working with his probation officer, starting to kind of come to some sort of realization that his father is at the the, the root of a lot of the issues that he feels like he's still ra- raging against right now and kind of coming to that forcibly coming to that res- that that realization. So there are some moments of the film I think really, really worked and are really, really pretty amazing. They're just stitched together with some very long, very traditional stretches of father-son in difficult situations and arguing and yelling and fighting and, you know. And that got to be fine. a little repetitive. It did get very repetitive. Yeah. It didn't really seem to advance things very much. Just when you think something might be advancing – it basically reminds you that no, we're still at the same spot where we've been the last hour. And so that's, that's probably the part of the film that was a little more disappointing to me. I Um, think, I think, you know, we mentioned screen time for Lucas Hedges. And I think something that also bothered me a bit is, you know, they should show him in rehab and they show talking to different counselors. And, but it seems like magically all of a sudden after that conversation about, you know, I'm act, am I really acting? How can you tell we're all acting? he has this epiphany and magically through a montage, he starts writing what we assume is maybe this movie Mm -hmm. and everything's better. And I'm like, 
okay. They just, it seemed a little rushed. And I think that's a script problem because he didn't have enough screen time to show more of a progression. It was like every time we saw Lucas Hedges in rehab, he was cranky, 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 cranky. And then all of a sudden, oh, I'm better and I'm writing a script. Now I'm crying and I'm emotional and I'm <laughs> writing and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's – um. I think it's an admirable film. I, I'm, I'm glad it was made. I'll say that. Okay, I think it was a, a an interesting concept of a film. I think it was a, and him playing his own father. You know, that's I thought interesting. interesting. It's got to be therapeutic to some degree. I would sure. imagine. I just wish it was a little more even. I wish it was a little more um, uh, picking a style that it was going to commit to, as opposed to dabbling in some creative styles, but then just still re- relying on a very routine kind of mundane traditional storytelling between the father and son. How the sequences of interaction between 12 year old Otis and the shy girl in the motel complex go for you. Um, and the shy girl was played by FK twigs who I'm yes. not familiar with, but she's apparently a musician as well as a musician, actress. a dancer. Uh, she's yeah. Uh, quite the entertainer. Yeah. Um, they weren't working for me at first until they got to a sequence where they did a, uh, kind of a, a silent, montage of a kind of playful thing that seemed worked for me. But up until that point, I wasn't quite buying it. It wasn't, wasn't gelling for me as much. Um, it had some interesting moments. And again, I think this is a film with great moments. I just wish the moments were stitched together with things that made them make sense. Yeah. That, that one moment you're talking about, about kind of pimp pantomiming and stuff that worked for me. That was a really good scene. But outside of that, some of the things that took place in a hotel room you know, it was kind of confusing to me as, okay, what exactly is, yeah. what are they, what are they meaning for me to get out of this? What am I supposed to be thinking is the relationship here? And maybe that was on purpose because maybe he as a 12 year old is actually confused as to what's going on here. I think he was. But it was very unsettling and yeah, yeah. You know, squeamish to kind of watch. But. Well, there's a moment too. And again, I can do this without spoiling anything necessarily for people who still want to see the film. Uh, there's a moment where the two, he is there with a much older girl, in the hotel room and they are obviously having a good friendship or kind of a companionship or warmth towards one another. And he does go and get some cash out of the the drawer and puts it in her hand. And, you know, that's when I first saw that I'm, I'm trying to process, you know, the thinking there, but obviously it's something where he, that's what he's used to his father having been had to do with any relationships he's had while he's been living with his father that that's what his father's kind of taught him. He even made a comment about it when the two of them were walking around together about, oh, you know, you're going to be one day be a big star and you won't have to deal with just these prostitutes or whatever else. So he's kind of implying that that's what he and his son have kind of believed is if you're going to have companionship with somebody, you got to pay them. And I thought that was kind of an interesting touch. But it is one of those moments where it's not as clear helping you understand exactly what the dynamics of the relationship are. A um, little unsatisfying, but I do love the the pantomime yeah. scene, the miming scene of them playing in a baseball game, which happens with a pretty nice montage with a nice bit of music, and you just get some sense of joy for the first time that you've seen this child have. Yeah, actually, out of the whole right. film. So that was an um, instance, a brief yeah. glimpse. Yeah. So the film, I think, was an admirable film. I think uh, it had a lot of interesting elements going for it, and it definitely was interesting to watch. It's just I felt like it was a little uneven and felt like a little repetitive and a little bit uh, kind of uh, tread water, tread water, tread water for an hour and a half and then get to some sort of ending that you kind of cram in the last 10, 10 minutes or so. Yeah, it was for me, it was like the end result of sitting through 94 minutes of cinematic therapy, a cinematic therapy session based on the Buffs Real Life. It was exhausting, more profanity than many Eddie Murphy's uh, movies <laughs> I've seen. Um, but, this one probably sets the record, yeah. But it did come across as feeling authentic. Now, how much did he slightly fictionalize? I'm not sure. But, you know, it, it did make it interesting. If it had just been a movie that he was in that was about a child star, you'd be like, okay. And it would have seemed very run-of-the-mill, but the fact that you know some of these beats have to be somewhat authentic – it did make it interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I think lukewarm is probably the best way I can describe how I'm hearing our responses here. And that I, I, I'm going to recommend this film to people if they're interested in the subject matter, if they're interested in the story that's being told. Uh, I think it's a worthwhile film to see. I just, uh, it is a little different than the film I was probably expecting to receive. Sure. And I wish it had just been more consistent with its storytelling style. 
throughout the film and been more even with that story as well. Well, that is Honey Boy. That, again, is, uh, as Chris mentioned, directed by Alma Harrell. It is her first feature narrative film. I believe that she's done some documentary feature yes. films, but this is the first narrative one. Uh, and it did have some documentary style to it at times, almost a fly on the wall watching in a hotel room the two of them interact. It did feel very much uh, like you're really spying in on conversations. So I, I think there's probably some of those documentarian sc- skills that she was applying to the filmmaking here. Sure. Uh, right, written by Shia LaBeouf and starring Shia LaBeouf as well as Lucas Hedges and Noah Jupe. So that is Honey Boy. It is on Amazon. It is an Amazon Studios film, so it is actually available on Amazon to see right now at the time of this recording. So if you find for yourself so inclined, uh, give it a watch and feel free to drop us a note and let, you, let us know what you think about either of these two films. These two, unfortunately, lukewarm responses we've had to two reviews here of films that both of them having elements we really liked, but just as a complete movie, neither of them really worked as well as they could have for us. It's early in 2020. There's still hope. (laughs) Yeah, it was still early in the year. Yeah. Early in the year, that's for sure. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a quick break, Chris. And when we come back, we're going to do our trailer tapas, soapbox, and our recommendations. So stay tuned. You're listening to Foot Candle Films here on TheMesh.TV. We will be right back. Hey, guys. This is Mary Margaret from the Chick Chat Podcast. Are you interested in promoting your business to an online audience? Your advertisement could be right here on The Mesh Podcast Network. Head over to themesh.tv for more details. Welcome back to Foot Candle Films here on themesh.tv. Alan Jackson, Chris Fry here with the Foot Candle Film Society and the Foot Candle Film Festival. So we had our reviews of Birds of Prey and our review of Honey Boy earlier in the episode. Chris, this is the part of the show that might be my favorite part when we get to do it. I'm just okay. telling you. I, lo- I like our reviews. I like everything else. But I am a trailer junkie as much as I probably should not be watching trailers because they do set unfair expectations for me of the films. I still love the art of trailers. Sure. This is a section we call Trailer Tapas where we actually are going to sample from three different trailers of films upcoming. And we're going to play the trailer. And you know, you may hear some of our reaction or comments as the trailer is playing. And then afterwards, we'll kind of give it a little dissection and talk about what we think about the film that's being shown and if it's something that we have any interest in seeing when it comes out or not. So, Chris, let's go ahead and get started with our first trailer tapas for the, for the afternoon. That is going to be the latest film from a Mr. Wes Anderson. You're familiar with him? Yeah, I've heard of him. We have discussed his films many, many times on this show. And he does have his newest film coming out which is called The French Dispatch. So let's listen to that trailer. It began as a holiday. Eager to escape a bright future on the Great Plains, Arthur Howitzer Jr. transformed the series of travelogue columns into The French Dispatch, a factual weekly report on the subjects of world politics, the arts, high and low, and diverse stories of human interest. You don't think it's almost too seedy this time? No, I don't. The decent people. It's supposed to be charming. He assembled a team of the best expatriate journalists of his time. Berenson, Sazerac, Kremens, Roebuck Wright. These were his people. Just try to make it sound like you wrote it that way on purpose. We take as the subject of tonight's lecture, Mr. Moses Rosenthal. Certainly the loudest autistic voice of his rowdy generation. Simone Naked Cell Block J Hobby Room. I want to buy it. It's not for sale. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes. In short, the picture was a sensation. The kids did this. Obliterated a thousand years of Republican authority in less than a fortnight. What do they want? Freedom, full stop. I'm naked, Mrs. Kremens. I can see that. Lieutenant Nescafier is the great exemplar of the mode of cuisine known as police cooking. The aromas of the kitchen cast a spell, which was to be mortally broken. As you know by now, we have kidnapped your son. Uh, 
A message from the foreman. One hour to press. You're fired. Really? Don't cry in my office. All right, so Mr. Chris, we have discussed Mr. Anderson's work in the past. We are both generally considered fans of his work. What is your initial hot take on the trailer for the French Dispatch? I could not be more excited for it. Um, I, you know, his trailers are some of the things that, you know, a lot of times I worry that things are going to be spoiled for a movie. His movies for me are generally so rich and there's a lot of stuff in there that I don't feel like they can really be spoiled. Like, I think I know what this movie is going to be about, but it's vague enough that I think I'm still going to be, you know, surprised and I think I'm still going to like it. And, you know, Wes Anderson is one of those rare people too, that when you see such a cast, I mean, he's got, you know, just tons of people, Owen Wilson, Bill Murray, you know, just all these people in it, his usual, you know, his usual cast of characters, but it doesn't scare me to think, oh yeah, it's star packed, but it's probably, it's loaded with that, but then something else is going to suffer. Like, you know, dead don't die. We saw that it was star packed and it didn't end up panning out that much for us. Wes Anderson is able to, he knows how to manage all the the characters, all the talent together on screen. So I'm really curious. I mean, again, it looks great. I'm excited. I love the fact that, yeah, you could say that visually the film looks just like a Wes Anderson film, but this one seems to have a little bit more of interest to it. Some black and white cinematography. Everything's still in a four by three frame. I think it was the same for a Grand Budapest Hotel as Some well. Some sequences were in four That's by right. three and then others were. Soon. Interestingly enough, the font used in this is the Grand Budapest Hotel font where it has little lights. Huh. It's like the letters look like they have little lights in them. And that's kind of how Grand Budapest Hotels lettering Maybe there's was some done. connection there. Maybe there is. And then even some of this, the kind of the poster and everything is cartoonish looking. And that's mm. kind of how Grand Budapest Hotel had some of that going yeah. on there. So I don't know if that's intentional. Maybe there is a linkage. And or it's, it's just a motif he's all in It's just love a motif. And, and people complain him. about Wes Anderson that that's all he is, is motif <laughs> and nothing else. But you know what? I'm along for the ride. If it's entertaining, like it. I'll still watch it. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm, my big question out of this, I mean, it's got the typical cast of characters from a uh, – it's almost like um, I get the impression with Wes Anderson. He starts with – he started years ago with a small rapport of, of actors, and he keeps adding to it with every film, and they don't go away. Right. So it's like they're still there. <laughs> You know, Tilda Swinton, still there. William Defoe, still there. Edward Norton, still there. He's added Elizabeth Moss. Added Elizabeth Moss and – Timothy Chalamet. Yeah. That's my biggest question. Chalamet's I don't know if Chalamet, <laughs> the only weak spot I'll give the trailer is Chalamet seems to be forcing the Wes Anderson motif a mm. little bit. Just with his hair? Well, <laughs> yeah, but just in his mannerisms, I, where everybody else seemed to be more natural, he seems to be like, oh, I'm in a Wes Anderson movie. I've got to act all Wes Anderson-y. Mm. I hope that's not the case. I hope he shines. I'm curious if, you know, he's going to be the next Jason Schwartzman, kind of the ongoing or one of the Wilson brothers, kind of the ongoing character that's known uh, in these Wes Anderson films. I don't know. Which it gives me hope Schwartzman is in this, but he is also one of the writers with Wes Anderson. So he's credited with doing some of the writing. So not that Wes Anderson isn't capable all by himself, but I think his movies benefit from having a little bit more of a balance when the writing comes into play. Agreed. Tony Ravorlo, who is, uh, was in Grand Budapest Hotel, mm-hmm. Angelica Houston, from uh, obviously from Royal Tenenbaums and a couple mm-hmm. others. Yep. Uh, Saoirse Ronan, also from Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, Christoph Waltz. I don't remember Christoph Waltz being in a... I uh, think he's a new one, I okay. think. Good. So Christoph Waltz, Elizabeth Moss, and... Uh, and then uh, Timothy Chalamet seemed to be Benicio del Toro. Oh, I think Benicio is del Toro is new as well. Yeah. yeah, the fact that we're rattling off all these names and they're all in this film is kind of crazy. Adrian Brody is a return from yeah. yeah. So so we got some good stuff there. So yeah, we're both very excited about this film and uh, looking forward to its release. All right, Chris, let's uh, switch it up and go with one that I have not seen yet and I'm very curious about. And let's talk about this film. This is the trailer for the film, First Cow. Anything you want to say to set this up, or do we just want to watch it and see where we go? Okay. First Cow. I have no idea what this is about. Let's watch and see. What's your name? King Lou. They call me Cookie. My mother died when I was born, and then my father died. I never stopped moving. 
It's the getting started that's the puzzle. No way for a poor man to start. You have a cow. First cow in the territory. This ain't a place for cows. No, it's no place for a white man either. I sense opportunity here. Good Lord, give me another. I'll give you six ingots for that last one. I taste London in this game. We have to take what we can when the taking is good. It seems dangerous. So is anything worth doing? A royal cow. Until she barely produces a thing. Some people can't imagine being stolen from. Let's hope he's one of those. We got a window here, Cookie. History isn't here yet. It's coming, but maybe this time we can take it on our own terms. Okay, so a film by Kelly Reichardt, who's, uh, I Meek's, will be honest, film, cut off. Right, but films I'm not as familiar with. So not being as familiar with her other work and not having seen any of the films, I, I don't know if this is kind of in line with what would be expected from her work or not. It seems to be a little more traditional a film, at least from the trailer anyway. Yeah, the trailer makes it seem like it'll be one of her more accessible films. More, a little more commercial um, Meek's films. Cut-Off did deal with early colonial, sure. you know, wagon train type stuff. So time period, yeah, she's done stuff like this before, but it does... Uh, have a little bit more humor than maybe you would expect from Kelly Riker? A little more humor, and there were a few more lines that were almost more like very commercialized, you know, lines that people would say in a film that, I don't know, it just seemed to try to pluck at some emotion. So, I don't know. I'm curious. So, I guess the idea of first cow, it's a cow from royalty? <laughs> Is that the deal? I'm, I'm not sure. Or whether it was just the first cow to enter into this territory. So they just kind of, yeah. And so they get cow. they get milk more readily because of this, or hmm. I'm not sure, but I just, cinematography and storytelling are strong points of Kelly Reichert. And I think this could maybe break her into more of the mainstream, mm-hmm. maybe. And it's put out by A24. This so she's done uh, Wendy and Lucy. Correct. Mix cut off. Uh, help me remember some of the others. Ah, those are the only two that come to mind. I know she's done right a couple more top. beyond that. Yeah, I just can't yeah. remember what they are. So, but she, you know, she's an interesting director, and I think maybe this could be her breakthrough film. And the fact that A twenty four distribution has a hold of it usually bodes well. Um, but we'll we'll see. So it's it's one that I'm definitely interested in. Okay. First Cow mm-hmm. that is uh, coming up this year as well. All right, and the last one we'll do in our trailer topics, Chris. This is one I'm really anxious to hear your thoughts on. This is the latest film from David Lowry, who you may remember did uh, A Ghost Story. Story. Mm -hmm. He did The Old Man and the Gun with Robert Redford. He did The Peaked Dragon remake, which was kind of an odd (laughs) odd choice for him to work on. Did he do uh, All Them Birdie Saints? Was that David Lowry? Uh, I do not remember. Okay, we'll look it up while the trailer's playing and verify on that. But I believe he did. I want to make sure I'm kind of clear on his filmography. But this uh, this one got a lot of buzz when it was released just yesterday. The trailer was anyway. So here it is, the uh, starring Dev Patel. This is The Green Knight. to tell yet. I fear I'm not meant for greatness. We all fear. But fear can be a gift. (laughs) 
Do not waste this. That's the trailer for The Green Knight. Uh, yes, David Lowry did Ain't Them Bodhi Saints uh, back in 2013, and then did Peach Dragon, A Ghost Story, and The Old Man and the Gun. So now we've got this film coming up. Dev Patel, supposedly it's the story of uh, King oh, Arthur's think... nephew or oh, cousin or something, <laughs> some relation to King, King Arthur taking place in the time of King Arthur. And the fabled green knight that he's to face. And very atmospheric trailer, very uh, interesting visuals, especially in the beginning. You have a, the main character sitting in a throne, all of a sudden bursts his head in the flames, which is kind of a cool visual there for it. So I'm curious. What about you? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. If you had just told me someone was making a movie of Arthurian legend and like, uh, I'm not really, you know, it sounds like a period piece, not really interested. David Lowry? Okay, then his cast, Alicia Vikander, Dev Patel, interesting. And the visuals from the trailer do look amazing and do look um, interesting enough to like keep me awake in a period mm-hmm. piece. So yeah, I'm definitely interested. And there again, I got to say, I've forgotten this, but A24 is also responsible for the distribution of this thing. And I tend to like a lot of the movies they put out. So I'm mm-hmm. definitely interested. Real quick, I did a little research myself while we were doing that. First Cow, Kelly Reichert, the director, Certain Women, she made in 2016, okay. Night Moves, which she made in 2013, and then we'd already mentioned Meeks Cut Off and Wendy and Lucy. So that's okay. a little bit yeah. more of her filmography there. Gotcha. All right, well, with The Green Knight, so we have uh, other people in it. We have uh, Barry Kagan, if we remember, he was from, oh, he was in American Animals, a film we really like quite a bit uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, we also have in here Joel Edgerton, Alicia Vikander, you already mentioned, Dev Patel, you mentioned. Um yeah, it looks really interesting. It looks like it's got a nice combination of some, uh, a little rem- remnants of swashbuckling, but definitely more atmospheric for this time period. Right. But some interesting use of you know creatures and other things we saw in the scene too. So I'm uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to this. I think this looks good. I'm a big fan of the King Arthur time period. I just don't feel like it's been well represented in film in quite a while. You know, we had Excalibur, we had some of those films back in the 80s and 90s that I'm kind of a fan of, but uh, we need a good King Arthur period film, and the ones we've gotten in recent years haven't been that great. So, uh, looking forward to this. I think this could be really exciting, very, very interesting, coming out in May of 2020, so don't have too much longer to wait for this one. All right, so of the three, Chris, I I don't even have to ask you which one you're most (laughs) excited about, it's... French Dispatch, yeah, Wes sure. Anderson, right? French, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm I'm excited for that one most. I'm closely following by Green Knight and First Cow looks interesting, so I I will kind of look forward to seeing that whenever it is released. All right. Okay. So three trailers in our tapas plate that we got to enjoy today. We'll we'll definitely be talking about those films, I'm sure, as we get later on in the year as we have a chance to see them. Chris, I'm going to wheel out the soapbox. My understanding Excellent. is you have something to share with us, a soapbox topic, something you'd like to discuss Absolutely. that's on your mind. What is on your mind, Chris Fry, on the film soapbox today? So, soapbox is dusted off. Let me let me climb on top, get a good balance here so I don't fall off. That'd be, that'd be embarrassing. So with the Oscars that have just recently happened, um, I'd like to say a little bit about Best Original Song Oscar. It went this year to... I'm going to love me again from rocket man. I have a gripe and here's the thing. I think best original song Oscar. I think it has to be used in the actual movie and be integral to the movie, not just in the credit scene. So you're saying, well, I, you know, if it's a good song, it's a good song. Well, great. Put it out on a CD, have it be on a greatest hits, have it be on the soundtrack for the movie. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that, but having it voted for best original song, I think is not a cool, cool thing. You look at songs that were nominated this year. I can't let you throw yourself away from Toy Story 4, which is who I think should have won. But we'll, you know, go back on that for just a little bit. Here's the thing. That was Forky's kind of theme. Yeah. Forky is integral to Toy Story 4. Therefore, and it's used in the middle of the movie in a sequence. Okay. That would pass the test to be nominated. Okay. Something like Into the Unknown, Frozen 2, same type thing, very plot point oriented, 
well, well made, well put into the movie makes sense. Then you have something like Stand Up from Harriet. Song's fine. The performance was amazing at the Oscars, but it's a credit song. It's not used in the movie, even as background music for something that's happening. So there again, I don't feel like should be eligible. Um, In the past, we've had things like, here's some good examples, Shallow from A Star is Born, makes sense in the movie, perfect, Place Where Lost Things Go from Mary Poppins Returns, perfect use. Okay, what are some examples that don't do? I'm Going to Love Me Again, like I already mentioned from, you know, Rocket Man, Glory from Selma, which won an award. Mm -hmm. That was a credit song sequence. It was performed at the Oscars, and there was a credit song sequence in the movie Selma, which I like the movie. They're getting, it just, I feel like if you want to have your best original song, obviously it has to be original, written for the movie, but then it has to integrate into the running time of the actual film itself to be eligible for best original song, the best original song Oscar. That's my thing, because I think, I, I, just, I, I just think that should be, just like you don't say for the best original score, it's not like best original score piece that was used at this one critical moment in the film. We're not nominating one piece of music. No, we're nominating the score of the film that runs throughout the entire film for this best original song. I feel like it needs to be in the meat of the film and have some bearing on events or somehow be commenting on them with the lyrics, not just be, Hey, here's a clever song. Let's tack it on the credits and win something. It's like, and notice that was the only Oscar that Rocket Man got. It was kind of a gimme Oscar for them. I just, and you know, the song itself, the performance of the Oscars, it was good. Elton John, he, you know, can write a song. Surprise. But have it be on the soundtrack. Have it be in the credits. Fine. Just don't put it up there for best original song. And if you do, definitely don't let it win. That's my soapbox. All right. Let me just preface this all by saying, ultimately, I agree with you. <laughs> Okay. I'm just doing this for the entertainment value. Sure. So let me play devil's advocate. Sure. So your your statement is insinuating that the credits are not an official part of the film. Like when you said during the running time. That have the bearing credits, that have bearing yes, that have bearing on the film itself. Not to say they're not important to watch and appreciate the people who made the movie. Sure. But they are not an integral part right, of the film let itself. Let me spin it then. So if you had an opening to the film. Same thing, James Bond, no. So credit sequence, you don't feel like even a James Bond no. animated no. Uh, design credit sequence is not part of the film? No. Wow. No. Okay, now that I disagree with you. Not on. that it's not part of a film. It is part of the film. It's not integral to the film oh, I I itself. Can argue, I can it's just it eye is. candy. It's, it's just eye candy. It's tone setting. It's setting of parameters. It's tone so setting. So it's tone, but it's not integral to the film. No. Credit sequences, whether opening or closing, they're great. They're window dressing. You don't nominate a credit sequence for an Oscar. If you do, great. That's something that can come down the road. But songs, are, they're just, no. They have to be integral for me. A best original song that wins an Oscar or even is nominated should be integral to the movie. Skyfall, that's a great song. It happened to be the name of like James Bond growing up home place or whatever. But not. it's a great song. It was great on the soundtrack. Not integral to the movie. Not. It's a great song. And it has okay. a cool little okay. opening sequence with all the little you know, yeah. animations that James Bond movies are known for. Not integral to the movie. All right. So, I just like hearing you get fired up. I, <laughs> and I think I'm the only one who cares about this. You hear people talk about all the other Oscar snubs and stuff. But, yeah, no one cares about a best original song except for me. Mr. Chris Fry. And does I, th- care. I think they need. I think they need to pay a little of attention and kind of change what makes a best original song. All right, but good. Well, there you have it. If you agree or disagree with Mr. Chris on the use of the best original song category <laughs> in its application right. to films, please write in your emails for or against Chris's opinion sure. to info at themesh dot tv. I n f o at t h e m e s h dot tv. We would love to hear from you. And again, Chris, I ultimately agree with you. I just, I like <laughs> yeah, pushing buttons. It's just I like trying to see, I like seeing you getting fired up and animated. Sure. So, all right. Thank you for the soapbox, Chris. No problem. Appreciate that. Always good. I should now we like put to it back those in the in closet. A bit. Now you've gotten <laughs> off your chest. Do you feel a little better? Yes. Good. That's a therapy. It's a therapy thing it's we therapy do here. Works, so. Absolutely. All right. Let's go ahead and wrap up this show with our recommendations of the episode. And Chris, I'm going to make this nice and short. Okay. I've got nothing. That is nice and short. No, I really do. I, <laughs> I would look back over the films I've seen in the last few weeks. I didn't really like any of them. <laughs> so Fair enough. I'm just, you know, I can't in good conscience 
recommend a film. And I feel like I've already tapped the well of all of my favorite films or films I want to share with everybody. I'm sure in the next couple of weeks, I'll stumble across something and I'll have another recommendation. But for today, I've got nothing. And I think it'd be a disservice Hmm. to recommend a subpar film just for the sake of recommendation or dragging the bottom of the barrel of my film list. So I'm going to pass. Okay. Fair enough. I, I feel like, you know what? Um, if you're so inclined to want to see something and I could not find a film of his, I was really a big fan of, but go dig into the filmography of Shia LaBeouf after seeing Honey Boy and see if any of his, you know, his career path, if you can kind of map them in relationship to the film you just saw of Honey Boy and kind of how that all builds out the story a little bit more. Again, I can't give you one to recommend because I looked at his filmography and I'm I'm not really a big fan of any of his films either. (laughs) So, um, fair enough. Anyway, I'm going to pass. I'm going, okay. take a, I'm going to take a mulligan this week, and I'll uh, move on to the next next episode. Okay. Chris, why don't you tell us your recommendation for this episode? So I'm going to recommend a film that came out kind of in late 2019. It was directed by Todd Haynes, who did Carol, so a lot of people know that film. It was called Dark Waters, and it's a biography kind of drama, but based on true events, of a corporate defense attorney played by Mark Ruffalo who takes on an environmental lawsuit against a chemical company that exposes a lengthy history of pollution. So you can kind of imagine it as a color graded in bluish and gray version of Aaron Brockovich, Mm -hmm. except it's not Aaron Brockovich. It's a guy playing, you know, it's Mark Ruffalo playing the lead role of this lawyer. Um, Kind of a Michael Clayton type thing, except it's based on true events. Um, Something that's, it is two hours and you're like, Oh, that's a long time. And it, It does, you know, it's very deliberate, very slow paced, but something that it did that I thought was interesting was that it gives you little timelines along the bottom of the screen at various points saying Mm -hmm. like, this is a year after or so many years before the litigation started. Now the litigation starting and then it kind of gives you keeps and it shows you how long and how slow, unfortunately, sometimes the wheels of justice Mm -hmm. turn. Mm -hmm. Um, It was really interesting. It's it is heavy because this is talking about pollution, the effects it has on people in this small town. And DuPont is basically the industry and how with money cover ups have happened. And it it's heavy, but mm-hmm. it is it is good. Um, Mark Ruffalo gives a really good performance and Hathaway plays his wife. And uh, Tim Robbins is also in the film. So um, if you're interested in movies that are based on real life that have to do with environmental issues or you just want to see some good performances by Mark Ruffalo – you know, dark waters and, you know, Todd Haynes, he makes, he makes some pretty solid films. Well, so. I was really curious when this film was announced that it didn't seem like a typical Todd, Todd Haynes film. It seemed very much a, yeah, you know, very much a mainstream movie, just uh, dealing with a real life situation, a legal battle, so forth. So to hear him do this um, was interesting on first blush. So you're actually, you're saying the film does it is a good good entry in his filmography. Yeah, but and it is a very different entry. You're right. Mm-hmm. You have Carol, which is dealing about, yeah. you know, forbidden relationships, and then I'm not there, which is kind of the weirdo, crazy biography thing about yeah. Bob Dylan. Um so yeah, it's it's so and then you had that one that we showed at a foot candle screening, uh, Wonderstruck, which is about a deaf girl and kind of through these time To this day, the one foot candle film we've shown at a screen I have not seen. seen. I was not there for that screening. Okay, so he just you know, he he makes interesting films. Is this kind of an odd entry as far as, yeah, it, it kind of is. Because it's not fantastical. There's no kind of unique doesn't odd anything to do with to music, yeah. which is the Velvet Gold Mine. He's been Bob Dylan. Even Carol, which was a fairly, relatively straightforward story. The directorial style was very, just a very elegant uh, visual style to it. Everything I see with Dark Water seems to be very by the book, kind of telling the story. But maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not. So that's, that's my recommendation. And just, I'll have to throw out there. We're not in the news segment anymore. We've already put that segment to bed, but I just saw looking at his filmography, uh, he has completed a documentary, no release date yet, but completed a documentary on Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. Oh, <laughs> no, that's going to be good. So no, I'm excited about that. Yeah, oh, yeah. So not in the news segment, but I can already say I'm so in on that. No, so. that's, that sounds really good. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Oh, now I'm more excited about that I, I than know. I am about Sorry. the film you recommended. I was recommending Dark Waters. But yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> Whatever, Dark Waters. Wait for the <laughs> – yeah, I want right. the Lee Reed documentary. Sure. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you for the recommendation. Thank you for kind of carrying the load for us this week, Chris, as I decide to opt out. Um, 
But I will have a recommendation for the next episode. I promise. That's your. I homework, will. I, I will make a point to see a good film <laughs> in the <laughs> next two weeks that we're not reviewing sure. that I can recommend, or at least go back and see a good film that I forgot about. So with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show. We did our reviews of Birds of Prey. We did our review of Honey Boy. Both fairly lukewarm responses to both films. Great moments in each of them, just not enough to make both of them, either of them, be really solid films that we can highly recommend. Um, and then we had our ter- trailers tapas, and then we had Chris's soapbox, and we ended with his recommendation of Dark Waters. So good show. If anybody, Chris, has some questions, comments, feedback for us in any way, shape, or form, how should they reach out to us? Send me your feedback on how great you think my soapbox was and how I'm right about the... Uh, <laughs> We're going to start a, a Twitter debate or right. an internet debate about the best song category. Sure. So send all that feedback to info at the mesh.tv. You can also follow us on Twitter at Foot Candle Film. We're both on Letterboxd where you can kind of track what we're seeing and sometimes we give short reviews on there as well. I would be remiss if I did not mention the Foot Candle Film Festival, which will be running this year from September 23rd through the 27th. Uh, I try to make plans to come join us in Hickory, North Carolina for that. If you're a filmmaker, we are still taking submissions for both screenplays and short and feature length films, both documentary and narrative. So I might consider submitting something as well. All right. Sounds good. We would love to hear from you guys. So let us know if you have any questions or feedback that we can uh, help respond to offline. And with that, we will plan on getting together for our next episode uh, here fairly soon. We'll have a couple more movies to review and some news to discuss. So until that time, we're going to go ahead and sign off for Foot Candle Films here on the TheMesh.TV. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you next time. See you in the ticket line. Special thanks to Carpal Taller for the show theme music. For more about Carpal Taller, visit www.carpaltaller.com. You've been listening to The Mesh, an online media network of shows and programs ranging from business to arts, sports to entertainment, music to community. All programs are available on the website as well as through iTunes and YouTube. Check us out online at themesh.tv. Discover other network shows and give us feedback on what you just heard.